Gardner, Councilor Gardner, Councilor Robertson, Councilor Perry, and Council Chair Maynard are present. And the first item on the agenda is a citizen's request for council resolution supporting universal health care. Sophie, do you want to set this up or? Sure, sure, sure. So um, I noticed you all were having a lovely conversation with Kathy before, um, before I logged on this afternoon. But um, Kathy contacted me um, with a request that council consider adopting a resolution supporting um, universal health. And I think you might be lacking the actual language from that. So while she gives her remarks, I am going to grab the language. It's very short and I can read it to you when she's done, okay? Okay. All right. So um, I'll just start with the remarks and then you can read the resolution. Okay. So uh, my name is Kathy Burgoyne, MD from Orono, and I'd like to speak about health care for all today. Martin Luther King said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. All Americans deserve basic health care, just like they deserve a public education. Americans have had the right to a public education since 1643, so it is time for all Americans to have health care. Its time has come. It will be good for us all. The U.S. is ranked 175th globally for health care access due to no laws manda mandating health care coverage. All other developed countries have universal health care. France has the best health care system in the world. They have a basic health care plan for all citizens, which I like to call the Ford of health care. And private insurance on top of that, the Cadillac of health care. Private insurance could still play a role here, just like private schools do in education. With COVID-19, 51,000 Mainers now lack health insurance, which is about 545 people in Orono. In the US, tens of millions have lost their health insurance due to COVID-19. We must stop tying healthcare to employment. With COVID-19, Maine's unemployment rate has increased to 10.6%, and these newly employ, unemployed mostly have no health insurance. A publicly financed plan would save Maine citizens, businesses, and towns money. Estimated at $1.5 billion, by a recent Maine Center for Economic Policy study. It would help Maine businesses be more competitive, reducing their costs since they would no longer need to provide health insurance to their employees. I urge you to vote for this resolution. It is symbolic, but extraordinarily important. Other Maine towns and cities like Bangor and Brunswick have endorsed it. It requests that the Maine legislature create an equitable health care plan that provides every Maine resident with comprehensive health care. You as town councilors and our representatives have a responsibility to consider large issues like this. Is this issue too big and far away for a town council to consider? The answer is emphatically no. How else are higher levels of government going to hear what the people are saying? I know personally that there are many of our legislators who are waiting to hear from their constituents about this issue. It is time for local government to speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Sophie, do you have the resolution? You want to just read it and then we'll go from there. Um, the Orno Town Council 
uh, universal health care resolution. And I just want to say this is the language that was provided. So um, it's not necessarily going to fit the format that you normally use, but this is the idea. Whereas every person in Orono deserves health care, and whereas a system which is simple and straightforward and provides citizen with adequate health care is necessary, and whereas eliminating high administrative costs and waste would be beneficial to families and businesses, and whereas improving the quality of life for residents in Orono by providing the health care they need is desirable, whereas Oh, and whereas 51,000 of Maine's population lacked health insurance as of June 2020, which would be approximately 545 people in Orono, and whereas tying health insurance to, to employment needs to stop considering the Maine unemployment rate is 10.6 due to COVID-19, and whereas a publicly financed plan would save Maine municipalities 8.3% in property taxes or 1.5 mills. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Orono, Town, Orono requests that Maine legislature create an equitable health care plan that provides every Maine resident with comprehensive medical care from birth to death. That is the um, similar to the language that they used in the Bangor Council. That's where I got the general language. And then I added some things that had to do with Orono specifically. Thank you, Dr. Berman. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions for the doctor before we talk about comments. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm curious about this. Um, saving 8.3% in property tax, because one of the things that we try to do when we're making statements about things that might be above our pay grade in some way is to connect it to how does this actually impact the municipality and do we have a case to make? Um, can you explain that figure? Well, right now, um, I'm sure Orono is paying for um, healthcare insurance for you know, teachers, firefighters, whatever um, town employees you may have. And um, that, if you take that um, over all the state and look at um, all the different uh, towns that are doing that, that adds up to about 8.3% in property taxes. And so if you instead um, publicly finance it through taxes at the state level, um, then the towns then have that 8.3% to work with to fund other things. And the businesses in town that are paying for health care insurance for their employees, they can be more competitive with, say, a business in Canada. Uh, in fact, a lot of business leaders are in favor of universal health care because they are tired of paying for ever increasing health care costs for their employees. When all of the countries that they're doing business with don't have to. You know, they're um, not paying for that because their government is paying for it, which is has, how it should be. Because if you lose your job, <laughs> you've lost your health insurance, <laughs> you know, or if you're thinking about changing jobs, sometimes you might lose your health insurance. You might stay in a job that you don't like in this country because you don't want to lose your health insurance. That's just wrong. You know, it should be like public education. It should be something that everyone has a basic amount of. Now, if you want to get, you know, a, a fancy plan, you can pay extra for the, in, for the insurance like um, they do in other countries. You know, say you want to cover, you know, cosmetic care or something like that. You can buy a plan for things like that. And a lot of countries you do have to buy, buy an extra plan for say medications or other certain things um, in there that aren't covered. Thank you, doctor. Sam, did you have some questions? Yeah, I'm gonna try, my, my internet's a little wonky and <laughs> I don't know where my charger is, so this could be a short meeting for me. Um, but Hi, Sam. Hello, how are you? Um, Good. Not, not to question that, I mean, not that I'm, this isn't a voice against that, but 
I see, I see your logic in decreasing the municipal uh, mill rate, that sort of thing. Uh, that money comes from somewhere. So, you know, kind of like pick your poison, which taxes are going to pay for it, perhaps. Uh, but I can see where it would have a huge impact on uh, potentially on our, at least it's not necessarily huge, but a significant impact on our mill rate. But, um, yeah. and again, not, not speaking against it, just when you're talking about that money, it has to be paid some, somehow. So. That's true. The state taxes would go up a little bit to pay for it. Does anybody else have any questions? I had the same question, Megan, so you took mine. <laughs> um, if not, I guess we'll go into a discussion then with the resolution. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I have one question. Sure. So, um, so is there an analysis by, say, the Maine Center for Economic Policy or some group that's done an analysis that, that that's how you got that 1.8 decrease? Because it's a it's nice to think that we would decrease our mill rate, but then there's you know, the, the challenge that the statewide, their, the cost would have to be paid statewide. So you didn't, it didn't include that, that there might be, that might be balanced in some by an increase in state taxes. Oh, well, I did um, say in my remarks, a publicly financed plan would save Maine citizens, businesses, and towns money estimated at 1.5 billion by a recent Maine Center for Economic Policy study. It would help Maine businesses be more competitive, reducing their costs since they would no longer need to provide health insurance to their employees. So it would help businesses and towns, but you're right that there would be some increase in state taxes, um, but that would be more fairly spread among the whole population. And um, we could spread, you know, for instance, uh, we could tax the higher income people more to pay for something like this. And it sounds, you know, there, that's a certain, that's a special kind of justice when you provide everyone Definitely. with the same support system for their health. So that's wonderful. Yeah, I think Martin Luther King would like it. And we've been talking about racial injustice a lot lately, but this is another, he said, this is the most shocking and inhumane kind of inequality. Um, Cindy, I also have a comment that since we're in the comment side of it. Um, I, uh, Doctor, I'm actually a person who actually deals with a lot of the, I, I, I am one of those people also agrees for universal health care. I live in a world that I'm, I get really affected by these groups. So I will use this example of when people talk about, I own a, a mail order pharmacy. So when people talk about costs associated and, and what people are paying, they, they rarely talk about a, a, an entity called pharmacy benefit managers. Um, they're, they're very large. They're your, your mm. press grips. They're, you know, they're the CVS Care Marks. They're the OptumRxs, all those guys. So for like me as a person, they charge me a fee when I fill a prescription to fill it saying that I'm going to, um, it's, it's a valid prescription, but I, which to the tune of $300,000 lost revenue which some people mm. get a lot of money. Well, when you when you work on small margins with the with the with drugs as it is as a pharmacy, it becomes even more hindering. Now, mm. the reason why I'm saying this is because the that group is the largest lobbying group. Mm -hmm. in the, very very powerful, and mm -hmm. they control a lot of this stuff. How, do you do you even see that being able to be overcome? Because I, I, we, we deal with it now. We've got all these entities all over the whole country fighting these fees, and mm -hmm. we can't seem to get the politicians to even budge. Hmm. Um, well, this is obviously a political issue. Um, doctors mostly are in favor of universal health care, as you can imagine. And if you think about it, um, there are lots and lots of middlemen here, and the insurance companies themselves are middlemen. You know, there, is other, there are other countries where the insurance company is out of the equation. And even in this country, I worked for the Indian Health Service on uh, the, the Penobscot um, Nation Island for four years. I was their medical director. And we just filled out a simple form and the Indian Health Service paid. And the only time we had to use their insurance is for certain elective things where if they didn't want to wait for it, for the Indian Health Service to pay, then they would go use some other insurance. It was so simple, you know? And 
when you take, and we have the uh, VA and we have the military, we have multiple um, single payer um, groups in this country. And Medicare is a really good payer source if you think about it. In fact, I went to five medical conferences in Canada. They were trying to copy our Medicare system, believe it or not, because it's so efficient and has low administrative costs. Right now, we are paying, like you said, billions of dollars to all these insurance companies with all their different forms you have to fill out. And that is wasted money. The money should go from the government to the patient and the doctor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sure as a pharmacist, you would agree. <laughs> and to the pharmacist. <laughs> so if there's no uh, more questions, then I guess um, I'll ask council what their thoughts are on taking up a resolution. And then if council wishes to uh, change any of the wording in the resolution. Um, I'd like to see, you know, have the resolution in front of us before we look at changing the wording. Um, I want to say, um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Burgoyne. Thank you, Kathy, for bringing this up. Um, I will always vote for whoever is going to support a universal health care system. I will always be an thank advocate for, for this. I am one of those people that lost their job in 2014 um, as a single mom. <laughs> this is the university when they were going through budget cuts. And I don't have insurance currently. So I am one of those people right now who just kind of goes, oh, I hope, you know, everything goes okay. Um, <laughs> and so far it has. So, <laughs> um, but so, so I, I understand. I totally get that. Um, what I wanted to talk to council about was my question on what is our purpose for a resolution? How do we, you know, what do, what do we, why do we put these out? What is our, what is our, um, uh, um, our objective? What are our goals and our objective for adopting um, a resolution? Not, not this one, but maybe um, in general so that I can have a better understanding of what it is exactly that we are, uh, that we're doing and we're putting out kind of into the into the world if that if we could have that like a quick discussion about that too that would help me it, it's Thank funny you. you brought that up because <laughs> other counselors have brought that up as well is that we you know do we have a plan do we want to become in the middle of you know social and political issues or um or do we want to take a step back and just concentrate on orno governing um, for my, just throw out my position, I, I believe in universal health care. However, I, I don't believe that it's Orno's job to, to do this resolution. I, I think that we can advocate with the state without um, doing a resolution. I don't, I'm not comfortable with doing a lot of resolutions um, because I don't think that we should be in the political realm so to speak, but I'm open to listen to others' views. I'm of the same mindset, Cindy. Um, I know that I may have kind of talked with you a little bit about this kind of stuff that um, it does become a thing um, where people then put you in the middle of those kinds of things when um, I look at really being thinking about being more effective about running our town in the sense of looking at making the decisions about where the budgets are and and and, and all those intricate things and to and and this is my my concern exactly is is that do you end up at some point where you get a lot of these and then it becomes a posturing as we heard in our last council meeting that somebody may may think oh you're being a democrat and i'm not so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm always asking the same questions because it, it does create a, a whole different uh, view of, of what we do. And, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm there. I certainly understand this, this topic that we're on right now. And I've had similar um, thoughts. Um, and what is our role? And is it, is it to push things politically? But at the same time, you know, we are in a position where we have collectively a voice. 
And if there is something that we feel strongly about, not, not just for ourselves and not just because, you know, in Cheryl's unfortunate case where you lost that, so there's a very personal connection. I've certainly been in cases and situations in the past where I've been without insurance. And, it, and this sort of thing to me is, is greater than just what's going to affect me or whatever. It's like, is it something that I consider um, so lined up with my values that, yeah, we're in a position where we can perhaps do something that may or may not have any direct impact, but certainly could help move this <coughs> forward. Hang on a second. Sorry, I, realized, I just learned that if you hold your space button, that takes you off mute. And I was getting tired of holding it, so I wanted to pick it up. But I think we're in a position where uh, we can actually be on kind of what I consider the right side of something. Not to politicize this, I know there are people on all sorts of, uh, have different views on this. But for me, even though this could generate more resolutions in the past, in, in the future, um, so be it. I think there's there's part of, we don't have to process every single one, but if something lines up with us, I think we can, and I would be in favor of moving this forward. So my feeling is that we uh, are serving our our constituents. We're serving the people of Orno by uh, by overseeing what's happening in the town and also setting policy for the future uh, of how we want our town to be. And people look to us because we do spend these hours uh, and we have this fabulous staff that educates us about how the town would work. And we, in doing this job that we've been elected to, we know a lot more than our constituents about how governments work and also how we can have a goal for the future. And it might end up feeling like it's very hard to achieve because there's so many things we need to do day to day. So we have some great goals in our comprehensive plan and the challenge is to try to meet those goals when we are having challenges meeting the, the cost of the day-to-day -day things. So that gives us a certain amount of authority to be able to then speak to the next level and the level above that of elected officials and say to them, we understand this is hard, but we think we want to remind you that we know how important this is. This is a matter of justice. We have uh, as I've said before, I learned before I got on the council when I was reading about our town that a third of the kids in, in, in the Asa Adams are on free and reduced lunch. So those one parent in those families can go on main care and have, uh, and have health care for their kids. But as soon as their child turns 18, they don't. And so we have families that probably have parents that don't have, have health care, even if they're children and once then their spouse may. And all of those are challenges for them to move forward. And if we were a country, a state, you know, we certainly can't be a locality, but if we were a state that said, this is what we think is just, this is the right way to move forward and provide a safety net for our citizens. There's no way we can provide that as counselors here, but we can alert the people at the next level that are elected above us that we think this is really important. And that this is our opportunity to do that. And just as people from the town will contact all of us and say, I don't understand, how does this work? Or can we do this? Or what's the challenges in doing that? It's, our, it's for us to say to the next level, we think this is something to put forward. This is very important. We know that there's a lot of other costs, but this is one that we think is important as people who are leaders in our town. So I, I'm supportive of it. I'm also supportive of the idea that we would make resolutions that are things that we cannot enact ourselves, but they're our way of alerting the next level up. And if we did that as individuals, say I went and gave some deposition, it has some clout when you say, oh, I'm elected official in my town. However, if the council together, the majority of the council makes, makes a statement that that holds a lot more weight when people at the legislature are trying to evaluate how they would spend money. So for me, um, you know, in general, when it comes to, um, you know, this question of why do we make resolutions and under what circumstances, there are a lot of issues um, that aren't specifically tied into the operations of our town that I think, you know, the way for people to reach the people who have the power is in the ballot box, is to vote. I mean, is, is for the individuals in the town to contact their state and federal representatives. For, there's a lot of things that people bring to us where it would be better for them to lobby their, their state and federal reps instead of us because we have limited power. And if we make a resolution, sometimes, you know, 
not to undersell, you know, undersell our importance, but there's a lot of people higher up than us that would go, so what, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so I'm always thinking about, well, if we're going to make a resolution, how are we going to tie it specifically to Orono's operations and us doing what's best for our town's operations? Um, for, you know, like Cheryl, this is a very personal issue for me. I agree that I think it's shocking and inhumane that there isn't universal health care. We live in one of the wealthiest nations in human history. Um, we should not have anyone who is lacking medical care or food or shelter. Those are basic human rights, and I believe that, and I support every political candidate who believes in universal health care. Um, it should not be a partisan issue, and I think that that is the thing that frustrates me about some hesitancy that I hear from counselors saying like, well, I don't know if, I, if council should get involved in a political issue or a politicized issue. Um, it shouldn't be politicized, it shouldn't be partisan. Council is nonpartisan and healthcare should also be nonpartisan. And it's unfortunate that um, it's not really a difference in values, it's a, it's, it's a successful lobbying campaign, a very powerful lobbying campaign. Um, that has convinced a lot of people that they are against universal health care for reasons I don't understand. But getting back to the issue at hand. Um, so um, when I think about how this would be good for our bottom line, I mean, I, I can make a case for that for myself. One of our biggest costs as a town is personnel, and it is the health care um, in particular. That, that can be a very substantial cost for the town. Um, for our town staff, and I'm, I know that the RSU, you know, has to deal with, with similar budget constraints. Um, and I also think about the um, recent, I mean, we, we talked about a, a carbon tax um, resolution and passed one uh, months ago, and the reason that we did that um, was to urge our federal delegation um, to focus on this issue because of all of the climate change related um, issues we've had in town that have affected our budget pretty significantly. And so I can make in my in my head, I can make a similar case for this. This is a significant part of our budget. Um, it would be a constraint that would be alleviated by um, health care that was not paid for by the town and by the property taxpayers of Orno. Um, and I don't believe that it should be a partisan issue or a politicized issue. Um, I, I guess my only concern is I think about, well, it's one thing for an individual politician to say, I believe in universal health care, and they can live or die on that statement. We are a council of seven people. And I think that the thing for me that would be challenging is, as much as I want to support this, what does, if all of us don't support it, then that makes things a little bit trickier because um, we all get lumped in together. There aren't going to be a lot of people who are gonna watch back on this meeting and say, well, which ones of you did want to pass the resolution and which didn't? We, you know, we all go in on it and you know, that's one thing, but if, if there's disagreement as to whether we should adopt this resolution, then it becomes a little bit trickier. So um, I would say that I would support it um, and I believe that it does directly tie into our operations costs and that that is a valid reason for us to take this stand. I would feel a little wary if there were folks on council who were very um, hesitant to adopt this resolution. But I do take this very personal. I'm also an uninsured person and I have been underinsured or uninsured for most of my adult life. So, um, you know, I, I, do, I do believe in the importance of this. Megan made such a good statement. I, I think my position would be I, I, I pretty much agree with everything she said. Um, I, I would support it. I, I also have that hesitancy about um, if other council members have some strong reservations, whether whether we should go forward with it. And, and I also am a little concerned about tying in such specific uh, financial implications as there were in the language that was read to us. Um, I, I'm more focused on the concept of universal health care rather than is it going to save the town 1.8 mils or whatever it was. I, I, I'm real hesitant about including that kind of language. Well, is there, um, oh, go ahead, Terry, do you have some? I, I, you know, um, 
Meg, th thank you for explaining this way. I, I kind of want to back myself up to where the reasoning why I was kind of like in the mindset. And it, and it is exactly what you were saying is that if we take on these things, then we, we have to do it as a council. And I had a conversation with a colleague of mine, trying, and this, this was part of this whole conversation, trying to navigate that. And I kind of went back to two examples that as a council, we were making decisions on, and it, I'll, I'll just put it out there. The first one was all about masks and stuff. And there was this like outcry from counselors about like, we've got a, the, the university kids. And then when it came down to it, it was like dropped to the bottom level. And then even somebody didn't even vote for it. And so, and then you do it with gay pride. There was all this amazing stuff that went on with gay pride. And then all of a sudden, if it wasn't one item, then it was out. And it's like, so my stance on these kinds of things is exactly what you had said about, we have to do it collectively. And I worry whether or not all counselors are on that same thing, or if they just, I don't know. I, I, I'm not calling anybody out. I'm just saying it has to be a, a group thing. And um, yeah. I, I, I hear what you're saying though. Um, I'm, I'm curious because, well, the mask thing was an ordinance. It wasn't a resolution. So, you know, so we voted on an ordinance that we needed, we felt we needed to, and it's okay to have dissension in the ranks, I think. Um, but um, I'm curious about why it has to be an all or nothing um, to support a resolution. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure why it has to be an all or nothing. We, we don't um, just, just to like clarify, that. I don't I don't mean every resolution. I mean that for um, again, I don't believe this should be a partisan or politicized issue. No. However, council is supposed to be nonpartisan. And mm -hmm. so if we tiptoe into the territory that some folks would consider partisan, I think it's important that we're that we're doing it that there isn't anyone who is feeling extremely left out or not wanting to, to do that. Because again, if you're an individual, if I'm just like, you know, a state rep or state senator or, you know, whatever, and I just say, well, this is my position on an issue. It's just focusing on me and I can get not elected or, you know, whatever. But if there are seven of us, again, people aren't always going to go back and look at the record and say, well, which one of you didn't want to do it, which did. Right. They're just painting us all with the same brush. So if, you know, if there were four of us who really believed in this resolution and then three who said, oh, I don't really want to do that. Um, I don't want to get in the middle of it. They have to go along with it because majority rules. And I feel like in, in, in a lot of the votes we take, that's how it should be. I agree, of course. There should, it's okay to have dissension. But this is a little bit different. A resolution is more about um, the the spirit of what what council of values, you know, and um, and that's different you. territory. Yeah, that that's what I was going to say. With this is a value system kind of um, kind of thing. Resolutions are different than ordinances, and 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 it is a and and it is a value system. And I wanted I was hoping somebody would bring that up. Um, and then my other question is, and um, you know, I like I said, I'm I will support um, universal health care in, in in any way, shape, or form that it needs to come in. Um, my question is always about what what we do as a town and a municipality, and in crafting out a resolution, um, what does it say about our value system, and are we representing all of our constituents? Because um, we do we do have people in town, and you know, and I want to make sure that everybody's represented. I think this might be a topic that we can all come to um, an agreement. I mean, people want to have insurance and they want their children to have insurance and they don't want to get sick. And we are in a crisis, a healthcare crisis at the moment. Um, and um, so my, I guess my question is about, you know, the, just the resolution it, itself. What, so I, I guess if we write this resolution, we, we make this resolution, where does it go from there? Does it go to our legislature? Where does it go from there? I, I think the idea would be that it would be voted on and then sent to the legislative delegation or you know, anybody that would take it at, at the legislature <laughs> at this point, I think. Um, Sophie, did you wanna add anything? Cause I, okay. I thought I had a possible plan to go forward is that if people are interested in moving this forward, it cannot be decided tonight. It has to be decided on a, right. um, 
council meeting. So maybe we could all take a look at the, the language. Um, if you're interested in moving it forward, um, you know, tonight it sounds like there's a consensus to move it forward. Uh, and then um, I had talked to Terry last week about potentially trying to talk about in workshop uh, what our council's goals and objectives with, with some of these resolutions. And I think that we were looking to do that maybe next week. So if you wanna move this forward, we can, and then we can have that discussion before the council meeting in October. Um, and we can go from there. I think this would be a good place to start um, to look at a resolution and to really and, and to really iron out our goals and objectives for, for crafting these. That's okay. When you look at the language in this one, barring a um, specific proposal, I don't know that I can back into 8.3 or 1.5, 8.3% or 1.5 mils. And it sounds like you guys are really more um, interested in the general value of universal health. Um, so most of the time you look at for how is this specifically impacting Orono because we want to stay there. Now it seems like you're kind of wanting to pop up to more of a value statement about people having access to health care and that we know this impacts our community kind of language. Um, if it's all right I think with you. We also I can keep general language about how it impacts our municipal budget without I, getting into specific numbers. I think I can I think I can do that with like, for example, 18% of our personnel costs are associated with health insurance. We we expend approximately two mils, the equivalent of two mils per year on health insurance. Those would be the numbers that I would kind of pull into this. Would you like me to take a little stab at this before you get to wordsmithing to yes. and send it back out? Yep. I can do that for you. Okay. Um, Dr. <laughs> you're, you're on mute. <laughs> I just wondered if I was allowed to make any further remarks or if... Um, sure. Uh, oh, okay. I just wanted to mention that um, I belong to Maine All Care which is a statewide group that is part of a national group called Physicians for a National Health Program. And I've been a member for, of that larger national group for many years, and it is not a partisan group at all. And like I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, Republican businessmen that are really in favor of universal health care, uh, especially if they're competing with other countries. And um, our Long-term goal in Maine All Care is that um, if the legislature does not craft their own bill, um, that we would go to a referendum. And having these uh, multiple towns that have signed on to this universal health care is really helpful in a referendum or at the legislative level. Just they, they can see that a lot of people are in favor of it. You know, it just helps them to make that decision. And so um, I think that, you know, it is an important thing to do. And the more towns and cities that do this, um, the more likely it is that we'll actually get universal health care. You know that phrase, as Maine goes, so goes the nation. Maine is a small enough state that we have actually forged the way on quite a few issues in the past and uh, been a model where we're small enough that we can try something and work out the bugs. And in fact, in Canada, it was one province that started their universal health care system and that it spread to the rest of the country. So um, I think this is important. I'd like to just mention too that if they, when they did a poll in Canada of the patients up there, 96% of them said they would not trade their system for ours. And you wouldn't know that by all of the ads you saw on TV from that the insurance companies funded that, oh, we're Canadians and we don't like our system, you know, it's not at all true, you know, and when they come, when Canadians come across the border into Maine, 
they make sure they have done their paperwork. So if they get in a car accident over here, they don't go bankrupt. You know, <laughs> they make sure they're covered by their Canadian health insurance. <laughs> because they, um, the U.S. has more bankruptcies than any other country due to health care. Kathy, I think, I think, I don't think we need any further convincing. I think we're, we're okay. moving ahead and we've got a bunch more items on the, uh, on the Oh, okay. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> I no. just wanted to add a few items here. Thank you, Kathy, very much. Um, so I think that what we've decided is we'll um, get it a little bit wordsmithed by Sophie, send out a draft, um, and we will move it forward um, to the next council meeting. And we will have an discuss upcoming discussion about our objectives on resolutions for a different day. Thank you, Dr. Rowan, very much. Thank you very much for listening. Sure. Okay. Okay. We lost somebody. Cheryl. We lost Cheryl. But um, we'll move on to the next council discussion. Um, next steps honoring Orono's history in collaboration with the Penobscot Nation. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Sophie chime in if she's got anything, but basically my concern was I did not want to lose this as we were moving forward on seven, several other things. So, um, but I'm, I'm interested in hearing how council would like to move forward with, with the information we've had and um, some options. I don't know, Sophie, if you want to add anything before we open discussion or? Nope. Okay. <laughs> so um, does anybody have any thoughts on how we can continue this relationship? Hmm. I'll dive in. Um, so I was, um, Gosh, it was such a great presentation. And I know that we kind of, um, we got into that space because, you know, we were discussing the sign and um, does the town seal belong in the sign? Or, you know, how are we representing Orno? And I, what I loved about that presentation was it really just opened the conversation up so much. Like for me, this really isn't just about, I mean, we do need to move forward on the sign issue. We have to get, we have, we have to make some progress for Dave. He's going to retire before we get these signs up if we're not working on it. Um, but um, it's, it's a bit bigger, I think, than just, you know, what do we, what do we put on a sign when people drive into Orno? Because what really came across in that presentation for me was um, there's so much about the, the land itself here um, and the, the existence of the culture that, was here long before Orno and, and is still here, but is, is sort of made invisible in a lot of ways by the overlay of, of the town. And, um, and so I, I'd be really interested in exploring, um, you know, as we're working with Parks and Rec on um, a recreational tourism kind of economic objective to think about the ways in which we can incorporate this information about place names um, and, um, and, and all of that. Um, I'm also thinking, you know, I've been kind of tinkering with this, um, the signage that would show, for example, um, you know, working with the historical society, like an image from Orono's history, say you're at um, the Taquerita and you have like a little sign that has a, a picture of what Ferry Hill looked like 100 years ago. It had, I'll admit it had never occurred to me to think about well, what other histories were here long before that building was built. So we can, I would like to find a way to incorporate more of the, the history of the area um, and the native history into any future projects like that. Um, and I also know that a lot of residents have, have contacted us at various times about public art. I think it's also um, something to consider down the line of, um, is there a way that um, we can represent um, that part of Orono's history um, with current native artists if, when we think about public art in Orono? Um, I'll stop now. No, thanks. Thanks, Meg. I, I agree with that. And, and I like that idea. I, you know, you took several ideas that have, I think, been floating through 
at least my mind, and you merge them, you know, so with the public art and, and, and also the history. And I, and I was really struck by that as well with the presentation, which again was uh, fantastic. And I wish, rarely do I say this. In fact, I may never have said it, but I wish that meeting went longer. I wish you could have learned more. Um, and I think you guys might perhaps agree, I don't know. Um, but I think also, I mean, I do like the idea of the signage. I was really, I am really impressed. Um, when I first saw the signs on campus on UMaine, I was wondering if it might be possible to include something like that here. Um, and so I like to further discuss that. I don't have a concrete plan. I don't know what the next step would be on that. So to answer your initial question, Cindy, I don't know what the next step is, but I do want to have it go forward. I have a suggestion. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good one, but it's a place to start maybe. You know, one of the things that I heard loud and clear during the presentation is that some of the ways we would seek to honor people aren't, don't line up with um, the cultural um, values. And so I think whatever we do, needs to not exacerbate where we are right now in terms of us deciding. So it would seem to me that um, perhaps some review of some grant opportunities perhaps to see what we might be able to fund as a partnership because I really think the collaborative nature of what we're doing is really important. Um, I would love to get a history put together that I could then replicate in many different places. Um, council chambers, interpretive signage on the website, you know, that kind of thing I think would be very helpful. I think it's really important that it not be done by me or my staff. Um, I, so I think we need to um, be prepared um, to hire and appropriately pay a consultant. Um, whoever that might be. Um, I also think that with our signage, um, you know, Darren and um, John Bear Mitchell, when we met with him and James Francis are so, they get that we are um, our own independent governing body that they don't want to tell us what to do any more than we want to tell other people what to do. Um, but one of the messages I seem to be grasping in our conversations was that um, Chief Orono on the sign isn't necessarily offensive because it's historic. By the same token, they don't name places after people. Um, and I just wondered if perhaps taking some of the values in the comp plan that definitely mesh with our heritage and trying to identify a um, member of the nation that is an artist that might be able to help us take those values and make them look a little non clip art ish might be a good way to kind of move forward. So that's my, those are my low hanging fruit. Um, before I get too far down the path with interpretive signage, there is a hierarchy with signage and it starts with gateway signs, wayfinding underneath that, from the wayfinding, the business signs, so the, the more detail, and then out of that come the interpretive signs. And I think we need interpretive signs all over Orono. I think we need them on our trails. I think it needs to be an experience to be in our community. I think that's what the comprehensive plan is kind of trying to get us to do. So those are my scattered thoughts. I think that's a great idea about the, the um, artwork on the sign, Sophie, because I know that one of the things that we were sort of struggling with was, um, you know, I, I think there was going to be a design, but then Old Town did that design or, you know, all of that. Um, but instead of us trying to come up with some generic, you know, a, a river and a mountain or something, um, 
that may be looking into into working with a, a native artist to represent those values. Uh, I think that's a really great idea. I'd be very interested in pursuing that. Um, I apologize for cl for clipping out of there. My my connection is weak, I guess, this afternoon. Um, there has been historically council to council meetings with Orono and the Penobscot Nation. And it might be nice to someday, if we could, I don't know if it's a Zoom thing or not, but um, to, to meet the council, to meet the Penobscot Nation Council as a council and, you know, and tell them, you know, what we are thinking and, and how we would like to, be, you know, not um, appropriate culture, but, but to um, incorporate culture and work collabor collaboratively together on Penobscot land. And, um, and that might be a possibility, um, you know, in, and, you know, and they could make a suggestion. I, I know James Francis is an artist as well. Um, and they could, they might be able to make a suggestion for us or a direction that, you know, that, that we might be able to follow um, and be very respectful of, um, uh, of, of who they are as a people and also who they are as our community members and our neighbors and our friends. So that might be something that we might be able to set up, which would be no cost to anyone. And it might be something that um, would show that we're reaching out um, for guidance. Thank you. So would, would you think that might be a next step then as to for me to formally reach out? And see if we can do some sort of collaborative uh, council meeting. Council, council to council. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's 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 always easy to reach out. You know, finding a date and all that fun stuff that can always that can always come later. Right. Um, tomorrow. You know, I don't want to be off topic, but I don't want to forget either. Um, tomorrow is an on bank. Uh, uh, there's a law. There's a uh, there's a case going on tomorrow that Orno signed off on as interveners, the, the Penobscot V Mills case. It's still going on. And I know I remember the Orno Town Council meeting. I was not there. Sophie was and Sam was and uh, signed off as um, interveners in that case. And the town of Bucksport signed off as interveners in that case. Our name, the town of Orno's name is still on the docket. They never took it off. Um, but that case is going on tomorrow. They're hearing it again um, with more judges. And, um, and that case is, is about water and taking the, and the river and taking the river away from, uh, or the jurisdiction away from, um, from, the, from the nation, the Penobscot nation. If they, uh, if they, if they I don't wanna say lose, cause lose isn't a good word, but, um, they'll appeal to the Supreme Court. I mean, this is going all the way, you know, they're not going to stop if the state of Maine continues to uh, advocate for taking away, uh, to, for taking away the Penobscot water or for telling the Penobscots that the water is not part of their, um, their territory, their reserved territory. So Orno is, is also involved in that, um, um, sort of, uh, you know, because we were we were listed on that lawsuit, and um, and we were listed in with uh, with the state of Maine. So, you know, um, I I don't know. I think it's important to know that that's happening, and that a lot of our our neighbor our friends and neighbors, and the certainly people on the island will be watching that lawsuit tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, just as a point of fact, usually they don't change the, the headings of cases once they start. Yeah. yeah, they usually just, it will say somewhere that Orno would dismiss the case, but, um, all right, well, maybe, maybe if, um, council is comfortable with it, I will, I will reach back out to Darren just to touch base because he wanted to continue to be involved in this. Um, and to keep him in the loop and to, and to try and reach out to um, Orono Council, uh, not Orono Council, the Nation's Council. I know they just swore in a whole group, so um, it might be a good time to try and reach out while they're forming yeah. organizing. Okay. Okay. When you talk with them, would you just let them know that we are um, 
very committed to trying to find grant opportunities, they might have a better idea of where to look um, for those opportunities. And when it comes to, for example, paying a, for assistance on a, on a um, signage um, partnership, that's something that we have funds in the TIF to be able to, to do. The history is going to would be more difficult, I think, to fund out of the TIF. But that's clearly marketing. Okay, great. And maybe and maybe Darren might be helpful with um, getting information onto the Orna website at least a little quicker than than trying to organize two councils to meet. So we'll get something. So we look as good as Orono, Minnesota, anyways. Um, Anybody have any thoughts on this topic? Um, I do. Um, I, 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 that, um, that meeting, uh, the presentation, um, really was, was amazing simply because he's such a, Mr. Francis is such a great storyteller. Um, and then I, I sent some to Sophie, but I realized, because I, I like to support local artists, and they, they put on some amazing stuff. And then I realized as I'm looking at, I have this paddle that was hand-painted, um, and it was Mr. Francis who actually did the artwork. Um, and uh, so it was kind of a neat connection, but I think going forward with it, they have such amazing artists. And I don't know if, like one of the people I've, I've gotten artwork from also that I would really love to see part of the process of like signage and stuff is I don't know if many people are familiar with Geo, uh, Geo Neptune. Um, it's a, he, uh, Geo is a non-binary um, drag queen um, from the nation that is really an amazing all, um, uh, uh, artist, as well as um, does print ads as a runway model, um, as a non-binary individual. So, but amazing, if you've not seen their work, I would highly recommend going, but I think there's so much talent over there that we could really, really add some incredible stuff into Orono. I think uh, Geo Terry is Passamaquoddy. Yeah. Um, but, um, I, you know, that might be a, something to, to look at. <laughs> yeah. Just so you know, Dave Milan, who never is still, found a cultural planning grant um, to provide communities up to $10,000 to assess their cultural assets and needs. Sophie, you just muted somehow. They heard of the cultural assets and needs. And to develop a cultural plan. That kind of seems like might be right up our alley. So we're gonna look some more into this and uh, perhaps in your October meeting will be a, re a request to authorize us to apply. We may have already submitted the paperwork depending on the deadline. <laughs> Great. Sounds like a great plan. Okay. Um, with that, if no one's got anything else on this topic, um, seeing nobody, I will move on to uh, council discussion four, next step, steps regarding racial equity in Orono. Um, just to give you a brief report of what I've been doing, I've been um, trying to kind of hone down what exactly council would be looking for in, um, in working with someone. Um, and where I've come from it is that the police department is going to work with um, a consultant regarding some, you know, racial bias, systemic racism, looking at that, um, working off uh, a bias, was it bias conference that they had presentation that they had about a year or two ago? Maybe. Well, anyways, I, I would simplify it, Cindy, by okay. simply saying that Josh has already been in contact with David and Desiree from Racial Justice Equity, um, Ra Racial Equity Just and Justice, um, out of Bangor. They're developing a relationship and are moving kind of moving forward um what we heard from david um, and desiree both was that um, issues around the police department and things that individuals may or may not have 
um, experienced really should be handled on more of a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, and so they are trying to find time to work together. And, and Sophie's got working with town staff. She's got another proposal on how to work with town staff. So given that, I was looking at council more of a perspective of how, when we pass an ordinance or legislation, you know, are we taking into how this impacts um, people of color and, and, and do we take that into account or do we just assume certain things? So um, I have been trying to contact uh, a legislature, legislator that I thought might be very helpful with this. Um, I have not heard back from them yet. Um, <coughs> so, and we've got another possibility at the university. So my thought to move, but I'm frustrated that I can't get this moving forward. So my question to council is whether we should almost flip it a little bit. I'll continue to try and find someone that could work with us to kind of educate us on, on the ordinance but could we start moving forward on the second element, which we had discussed, which is creating a um, stakeholder, community stakeholders kind of, not a committee, but an event where we could meet with community stakeholders um, and get to understand where they are in, and how they feel that Orno is either representing them or not. Um, and then, depending on how that went, we could then talk about whether it's a standing committee or, or a reference point or, um, so I'm, I'm wondering if council is comfortable with me moving forward with that, even though we haven't really had a group think on uh, systemic racism for council. And, under, and also remember that any council meeting um, is going to be public. We could not get that under executive session. So that's why I'm trying to stay away from the kind of deep soul searching that council should do individually um, because it will be on the record. So, um, um, but I'm up for suggestions and anybody got anything? I'm okay with you moving forward, Cindy, on this. Yeah, I think that it would be um, fine to to move ahead with the, the sort of round table. Um, I also, I didn't know when you mentioned the person you're trying to contact, I wasn't sure if you had a personal relationship with them or not. I can also reach out to that person. Yeah, if that's, um, helpful. If, if that's helpful. I, I do have a personal connection, but it's... <laughs> It's not getting all the way through. And I, the only reason I just, I don't want to put it, put the name out because yeah. um, she doesn't quite know that it's coming yet, so. Right, I, okay. I hate to ask this, Cindy, but in my Wi-Fi just kicked out and I missed all your presentation. And before I have any comments, could you give me like the very nickel tour of what you just said, please? Absolutely. Basically, Sam, to, I was trying to get someone that could come in and talk to a council um, high level on uh, biases and racism that we might be putting into legislating when we legislate or when we do ordinances. Um, I have reached out to a couple of people and um, have not gotten word back yet. So I'm asking if we could kind of continue to move this by looking at uh, the stakeholder community meeting um, and I will continue to try and get someone to come in to talk to council. That's right. That's where I thought we were with that. And yeah, absolutely. I support that. I think that's great. Okay. Anybody else? I, Cindy, I, I would support that also. Um, I, I thought the article in the Bangor Daily News recently about the advisory community advisory group that Bangor had put together was very interesting and and might be something down the road that um, we would want to consider. Yeah, I, I think that what I'd like to do is kind of try and put this group together and it would be religious leaders as well as, mm -hmm. as um, representatives of people of color and, um, and see how it, 
how it works and whether it's um, something that we could lean back on when we have specific ordinances and mm -hmm. that we want to look at. It's good. Anybody else have anything? Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, these initiatives and, and I I uh, think that it'll be great for our town for us to move forward with getting in learning as a council from people who are spending a lot of time thinking about this more than we have and yeah. uh, have a lot of knowledge and also from hearing from our own citizens uh, and having them be part partly advisors to us and how we move forward. Great. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, I'm just wanted you all to know that these things haven't dropped and we're just fitting them in with everything else. So, um, so I think I've got enough to go on as far as direction. Um, and so I can move on to the next item unless anybody else has anything. And so that would be um, council discussion and disposal of the former public works facility, 98 Penobscot Street. That's all Sophie. I'm going to set it up and Dave's going to help me with this conversation. Um, if folks would remember before the pandemic hit, um, Dave and I talked with counselors and community development committee about um, disposing of the former public wa works facility at 98 Penobscot Street. And at that point, we'd been through the voluntary response action plan, which is um, from DEP dealing with the Brownfield site that's located there. We had um, an appraisal done on the property um, and we talked about potential uses for the property. And what we came to is that this is a very unique site because the way it's been used for the last many, many, many years is actually only allowed in this zoning district because we, because the town did it. No private entity could do what the town does, used to do there. Um, we also talked about how traffic is kind of inconsistent with the neighborhood where um, in order to get to this particular parcel, you're going past neighborhoods. And um, at that point, Dave was tasked with opening up his Rolodex and trying to find a private sector partner who was interested in redeveloping the site. And so the unique thing about this site is if it's used for commercial or multifamily um, redevelopment, it um, has very minimal work that needs to be done to bring it into compliance with the VRAP. If it's used for a single family home, there is significant work that needs to be done. So um, we, the appraisal um, actually had two different components. One was if it was sold as is, and that value was about $125,000, but it kind of pre presupposed continuing to be able to use the use of the public works garage. And then um, the value um, and they thought that that would take about a year on the market. Um, the other values that were given were based on um, if it were vacant, meaning we took everything off the, the property. So we took down the garage and, and um, then the value ranged from 50000 to $110,000, depending on how it was marketed. Um, 50,000 being a traditional multifamily dwelling, 110,000 being for commercial development. So Dave wore his fingers out trying to um, run his Rolodex. And at this point in time, we are not able to um, identify any private partners. Our suggestion to council is that um, you consider giving us kind of either what you really want there or what you really don't want there and we go out and market it for sale. We have received one verbal offer. I'm not aware that, that the written offer has come in, Dave. Is that correct? Correct. They've, uh, they've asked actually to get access to the building again um, 
this week, so I'm working with uh, um, uh, uh, with Rob. I, I believe it will be coming, but uh, um, it has not as of yet. But that is for um, twenty five. Twenty-five thousand dollars for the for the property, and I don't know enough about what the the plan would be. So um, we need more assistance, um, unless you just want this to sit. And I'm not sure things are going to change. At this point, we've locked everything up. We have um, now have big, huge cement barriers in front of doors to try to keep people from going in because. This has become an it place to vandalize. Um, so we want to we want to kind of figure out what the next steps are. Could I ask some questions, or is Dave? Are you, did you have something you wanted to present, Dave? Um, I'm just following up on on what uh, uh, Sophie has has done a a good job with. Is that um, again? I have one. One company that uh, is interested in and in, uh, has has verbally um, uh, shown interest in uh, in providing an offer. They're just trying to finalize what the plan would be. What I have what I have encouraged them to do was to, uh, if they were going to be coming forth to the town with a proposal, especially if it's a low ball um, offer. That what they need to do is is uh, very eloquently describe what their investment in the property would be, so that what the what the uh, value of the property would be on the other end of the investment. Um, and so they've been taking their time, um, I believe, to uh, to fine tune that and and in order to be able to to come forward. Sorry, I was just taking notes. Did anybody have any? Carol, were you or muted? Were you talking to us? Yes. <laughs> I have some questions. I was muted. Um, and I do, and I have the appraisal in front of me. And there's a couple things that I wanted to ask Dave, um, or maybe Sophie would, would know. What are, and, and the, the appraisal says that, that there are no recognized environmental conditions given, um, but it also says that the public works facility investigations were not exhaustive enough in scope. So what does extraordinary assumptions mean? When it says, when, when I see something called an extort, we're gonna make an extraordinary assumption that this site is, uh, is ready to rock and roll. Um, has the soil been tested over there? And I also, and, and adding on to this, I've also talked to the neighbors over there about what they would like to see. Um, and it's, and I'm not going to say everybody, but probably five or six people um, that I know. And they're, they're really concerned about traffic um, going up that street because um, it's pr primarily residential. Um, and they're very concerned that a uh, development doesn't go in there. Another student housing development is not um, is not part of that property. But my first one is extort we're making an extraordinary assumption. So I'm gonna take a, a stab at that and a little bit more, Cheryl. Um, okay. So when we did the VRAP work, which is a voluntary response action plan, um, we did many soil tests. We okay. we all over the place they could not come up with anything in the places that they would assume it would be. However, it is a public work, it was a public works facility. So that is why what they're saying is they have no basis to make, to say that it's contaminated. However, um, there's a possibility, which is why we have the cover requirements. And if it's a single family home where people are bound to dig for gardens or kids digging holes just because it's fun. That's why it requires that additional no buffer. dig requirement and buffer on the soil. But what they're saying is we didn't, they didn't look every square inch with 
soil tests, but we did a bunch and then we went back and did a bunch more when we didn't come up with any. Um, but at this point, there, there are no confirmed um, contaminants. Okay. Was it a phase two? Did you do a phase yep. two? Okay. We did. We did. Um, and um, so, and the other thing too that's not on the list, and, and I know we've talked about this and I need to write this down somewhere, um, solar panels. Why was, what is the, what is the, what was the reasoning why, and these are what people have asked me, what are the reasonings behind um, not having a solar array on that particular property? So I think our thinking was twofold. Number one, um, around the access to three-phase power or the setup for three-phase power. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I think there was a concern about having, um, for ourselves, having um, a setup like that on a parcel that uh, we are experiencing quite a bit of vandalism on right now. And I think the other piece is that we had hoped to not have to deal with the costs of um, taking the structures down and flattening the earth. Um, I'm not sure that it would necessarily be a bad thing for other private entities if there was some mechanism um, there. But I'm going to go on just a little bit, Cheryl, to kind of speak to some of your other concerns. I think the idea of traffic in the neighborhood has been has been spoken about at council several times, and this desire to make sure that whatever we do there ends up being compatible. What concerns me is that, barring very clear guidance from the council, either through contract zone zoning change or deed restrictions, deed restriction being the hardest for us to enforce, um, we could end up with any residential um, development there, um, automobile sale and repair, barber or beauty shop, building supplies, childcare, commercial schools, communication tower, conference center, dance hall or nightclub, restaurants, including a drive-through, financial institution, funeral home, group home, nursing home, or assisted living facility, retail, research and development, recycling center, traveler's accommodations, a vet clinic, wholesale business without outside, with no outside storage, artisan manufacturing, cultural facilities, or we don't have to worry about public services, but essential services. The reason I bring that up is that do I think there's going to be a, re a restaurant with a drive through down on Penobscot Street? Probably not, but the code allows for that. And essentially, we're on the back side of a C2 district, but we're really, I think, when I'm trying to channel your desires, it feels more like a medium density residential zone or a low density residential zone where you seem to be kind of going in terms of compatibility and and driving past the neighborhood. So even things like um, using that um, old garage as a, a warehouse currently is not allowed. If you looked at maybe putting some other zone under it as a contract, so you'd sell it with a contract zone, um, as another option. Um, but I think you want to be very careful to find a way to restrict the uses to, to either prohibit what you don't want or only allow what you do want. Is this a potential marijuana site if the referendum were to pass? Um, don't know that we can grow in the C2, but it would technically work for retail, um, manufacture. No, because it would have to be artisan manufacture. Maybe they could do that with marijuana. I don't know. 
Um, I thought I thought that the the there was something it had to be on Park Street or no for the retail in that part in that C two. So or was that it, just Kyle assuming that it would be Park Street? Yeah, I, I was just thinking that maybe we need to clarify that that in the so. That, yeah, that would be in the that would be in that Park Street section. What he was talking about was differentiating between um, that area where Leadbetters is, and that's the C two versus Park Street C two. This would be part of the C that Park Street C two. Another suggestion was Orno um, Land Trust as a or using it's a big parcel though it's it's over three acres. Um, was um, there's no parking for Piney Knolls, those trails up there, those Orna Land Trust trails or those trails that's right. There's, I don't know the name of it, but there's a trail at the end of Penobscot Street that a lot of people use. And there was some discussion. These are informal discussions, by the way, these are just friends. So um, there was some um, wondering if that particular um, parcel could be used for, um, to put in a, a warming hut for people who are cross country skiing or biking or some something that ha is more recreationally based um, at in that area that the tra traffic would be reduced. We'd have um, you know bike trails and hiking trails up there. And I I I was not I, it wasn't on the list. I wasn't um, aware that that might be a possibility either. But it was something that I I said I would bring up if there was any, um, I don't know, just as a possibility. Carol, that kind of goes along with an I something kept floating through my mind with, we, this came from, I think, us looking at making sure the land that we have, that we own, is creating benefit. Either we're unloading it, we're selling it, it's generating taxes or whatever, or perhaps it's serving some other benefit. You know, what would the benefit be of that? Granted, there's huge expense having to get that property cleared up and whatnot, but that is something I was thinking is the answer may not be just selling it and getting some business to come in there and putting who knows what in, but is there just another use that maybe not in the next 10 months or so, but somewhere down the road, we could turn into um, a great addition to the Orono community, especially over on that side of the river. Yes, I think that's what they were thinking, Sam, is some kind of a recreational um, area, park, a park, or just something that can connect to those trails over there. Well, and even with the vandalism, I think, the, you know, an abandoned building, which for all intents and purposes is what we have there, um, is a magnet for vandalism. So I don't think vandalism would always be necessarily something to worry about. Hopefully it wouldn't. Where I would put my pitch in for um, given the cost to take the building down and the fact that the land trust might be interested in it, um, I think to build a, another park when we have, when we continually hear um, concerns about our ability to um, fund operations, especially in an area that already has a um, a park adjacent to it. You know, we had talked about putting a playground in at Marden Park, but that area has got Marden Park and Webster Park. So I wonder if if we wanted to go that route to to go to the land trust to see what they might be able to to do. Um, and then I also have um, somebody whispering in my ear that, um, you know, if we really want to go all out, uh, try to get some grant funds to build a community center out there would be another kind of option to address some of our space needs with regard, if we're going to maintain it or have it um, regard, with regard to um, our rec programs and things that University is running out of space for as well. So um, I think what I need is just guidance. Um, if you're going to open the door, uh, you know, before it was very much based on trying to get tax 
this out on the tax rolls and um, out of the town's hands. But if you want us to be more creative, creativity is something that we have in spades. So I'd be willing to look at a whole bunch of different options for you. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what the uh, the party that um, Dave has worked with that has some interest in it, even even though they're talking about a low ball figure, what their proposal is before we move forward with something else. I mean, if we have a party that's interested, let's see what they have to say. We don't have to agree with it. I agree with Tom. I, I, I my, my growing concern is um, not to say that the, these aren't valid concerns, but it, it's almost kind of like not in my backyard, but yet people complain or like they should about the high tax cost, but people are using lands that don't belong to them. And if you can't, you can't build something there, whatever. I, I worry that we start going down that road while meanwhile we have, we're huge need for some taxable um, places. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 you can't I, we do have a lot of spaces to go enjoy I, I use them every single day um but yeah we i i, I i'm with tom in a sense let's 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 pursue these two possibly um people to see where it goes uh cheryl thanks so much for bringing this the idea of of connecting this to a place for people to rec that where they're already recreating and that would create parking uh, it is a large parcel. I, I've been trying to figure out how to put this because it's right there with that beautiful view of the river. Yes, there's the railroad tracks and it's quite steep to get down to the river. But uh, in this idea that Orno, uh, we want to make it a place where people come and come here to recreate and then come to the hotels that are here and come to the restaurants that are here and spend their day in Orno that, uh, that perhaps partnering with the land trust or maybe even finding someone who wants to expand and create some recreational place would be great. And, and uh, Sophie, your idea about perhaps sounds like it would cost us money, but it sounds also like a very interesting idea that we would have some kind of community center there. So uh, yes, of course we should hear what this proposal is because uh, it would be nice to put it on the tax rolls, but we also have a chance to imagine what we want our town to be and to create special places that uh, that enhance the entire town because they become destination places. Um, Sophie, does that give you enough to go on? All right. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, one of the things that the review to prepare for this brought up is that we've had lots of um, discussion about the public works garage. Um, but in all of the council orders, we have not actually done the public hearing that chapter two of our ordinances require to dispose of it. So that hearing does not say how we dispose of it. It just is our getting feedback from the community about disposing of it, which might also give you some um, feedback from citizens. So I um, had already scheduled that public hearing for the October meeting. Um, if unless you guys would like me to kind of back away from that at this point, my plan, I think it does not preclude you from doing any of the things we talked about today. I think I think it would be helpful to have the public hearing. Um, maybe we'll have some information if there's a if there is a buyer potential buyer, um, but it would also give us some feedback from uh, residents. I agree. Okay. Um, so I think you've got that under control. So now we're moving to brief town manager's report. Let's start with the exciting news. Um, today we welcome Sam Wiseman to our team. Sam Wiseman is a nine-year veteran um, for firefighting. Um, he is a firefighter one and two paramedic trained with hazmat at the level that we require here. So he comes to us with all of his training in place. We just need to teach him about Orono. He comes to us from the city of Old Town. So um, we have worked with Sam for a long time. Um, and we're just really excited, 
to have excited to have him start. He will do a two week training um, on the floor, uh, which is a day shift five days a week. And then he will transition on to one of the um, three shifts. So we're, we're really happy to see that. Um, don't know if folks saw, but our partner down the road um, at the, uh, the VZ Police Department and Mark Leonard were um, honored by the New England Chief of Police Association for their community work. And um, we all sent him a um, congratulate, congratulatory message. So just wanna make sure you know you've done that. Um, the culture grant that we just talked about is due in April, funded in June. So we, we will take some time to get a good scope and put a good application together. Joe and I are in the process of reaching out to the main bond bank um, around an application for um, WPCF um, borrowing up to a million dollars for the um, Mount View Mahaney sewer work with uh, hopefully some loan forgiveness there. Um, so you might see some orders coming through on um, the October council meeting for the for that um, application. And finally, um, Maine Municipal Association convention is a little different this year. Uh, we're not driving anywhere. Sorry, Tom, no great food. Um, but it is a live streamed, um, well, it's a combination of live stream and then virtual um, sessions. If you look, everybody should have received the Townsman, which has a breakout. They were not completely clear with folks about the pricing for that. Um, I've talked with MMA, they were gonna send out some clarification. So you can spend $90 for the entire convention and go to whatever you want in that convention. You have to sign up in advance so that you get the um, links and you get registered for whichever sessions you wanna go to. If you're not interested in the whole convention, you can pick and choose, so a la carte at $20 per session. So if you saw one or two sessions that you really thought would be worthwhile for you, um, that might be worth 20 or $40 for the town to pay to get you set up for that. So if you um, know what you wanna do and you'd like Nancy or me to sign you up, we're happy to do that. Um, if you are unsure and you wanna talk about it, give me a call and we can do that. And then the auditors are here, it's official. Uh, they're not really here, they're on an open Zoom call for the day, but they'll be here all this week. And um, Tom and Cindy, I think they're looking for you to um, let them know when you'd like to meet and they'll make a plan to do that. You guys usually like to do that towards the end so that you get an update on how the audit kind of went. Um, but they'll be here till Friday. And we have our rating calls scheduled. Staff did a really nice job working to get the preliminary official statement data pulled. It was a lot of work for them to do and it just so happened to lay right on top of getting um, the audit material done. So this has been a busy, busy week and a half or so in finance, but they've done a nice job for us. Great. Um, one thing I wanted to add on to the MMA um, convention is I encourage everybody, if there's something that you're interested in, to please look at it. But also remember that we did cut some of the training budget and we're using it in for some of the, um, the initiatives that we're talking about. So please don't just sign up and not go. <laughs> um, and next Monday, I don't know what Sophie's got planned, but I was hoping to do Sophie's evaluation next Monday um, and to talk about the resolution, kind of what our plans are for resolutions. So I have, um, we're starting to try to cycle our um, operations, especially the ones that are impacted by the pandemic 
through to get some feedback from council on the speed with which we're opening or not. Um, Lori is going on vacation when other members are going to be here. So I had, I had asked her to be prepared for a brief conversation next Monday about library services, where we are, and kind of getting some feedback. I'm more inclined to go very slow with library services, um, but I could use some thoughtful feedback from council about that. Um, and I have um, Connor Archer prepared to speak. He's got a development proposal that, that will require a contract zone or a zone change. And um, he and um, Kyle have been working on that. We need to get some initial feedback from council to see what direction we should be heading in with that. And potentially also a discussion about a contract zone out um, on Forest Ave for um, a, a project that is currently not allowed in the zone, but might make sense for the zone. That's a preview for next Monday. <laughs> um, so if that's it, I think we can move to adjourn. Okay. Sophie, can you stay on for a second? Sure. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good evening. And bow to. Yeah. Thank you.